Welcome, future doctors, to another episode of the Future Minority Doctor Podcast with Dr. Sulma and Marina, where we bring you conversations to empower and inspire you to contribute to your community and the world by becoming a doctor. Welcome back, future doctors. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, we have a very practical and useful topic to discuss, and that is the topic of improving your memory. Why is this so practical and useful? Because as you know, if you want to become a doctor, you have to be in school for a whole lot of years. You have to take a whole lot of classes. You have to learn a whole lot of stuff, and that involves memorizing a whole lot of things. So memorization and learning is a big part of this process. I remember in medical school taking anatomy and having to memorize hundreds, if not thousands of body parts. There were bones and parts of bones, organs, blood vessels, nerves, muscles, and the muscle connections, like where each muscle connects to each different bone. So there was a lot to memorize. Not only did I have to memorize the parts by themselves, but at the same time, I had to learn how each part functioned. For example, which muscles make your arm lift sideways or which nerves make your fingers able to move, like grab something or extend? I'm sure you remember that too, Dr. Zulma, don't you? Oh dear, I think I lived in that anatomy lab. (laughs) Yes, very much do I remember. Uh, I remember looking at the big anatomy book, remember, and thinking, how in the world am I going to memorize everything in that book? (laughs) Uh Oh, yes, I remember thinking that too. (laughs) It's like, how much can I cram in here in like three months? Because that was basically how long we had to learn anatomy. Even if you're not taking anatomy, most classes you will take as a pre-med in college and later on in medical school will require a lot of memorization as part of your learning process. So learning some tips and tricks to improve your ability to memorize things is going to give you a leg up, but only, of course, if you put them to work. So we're going to cover a few things in this episode. First, we're going to talk briefly about how learning happens in our brain. Second, we'll talk about the importance of something called retrieval or recall practice. And then third, we'll talk about other things you can do to keep your brain and your memory functioning at its best, such as getting enough sleep. Okay, let's start with understanding a little about how we learn. Dr. Marina, walk us through the basics. What happens in our brain when we are learning? Okay, there are three major stages in learning anything. So this could be learning ballet or piano or physics or anatomy or French or anything. So, and just a little bit of a note. So nobody, not even like the best neuroscientists in the world, (laughs) understands completely how learning works because the brain is a very complicated organ with about 86 billion brain cells called neurons. These brain cells or these neurons are all interconnected in very complex ways, kind of like the strings in a very large and intricate spider web. Trying to understand how these about 90 billion neurons work together to build memories and learn is really challenging. But we have learned a lot through medical technology like brain scans. So there are some things that we do know. 90 billion neurons? Wow, that's a lot. You know, I question about the 90 billion neurons because I felt like sometimes I still couldn't memorize everything in medical school. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's true. Oh my, overload. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, learning, yeah, learning is, the neurons are there, but learning involves like making connections between those neurons that we have. Um, So, you know, it still takes a lot of work. (laughs) Okay. So we know that stage one of learning, it's called encoding. Can you explain what encoding is, Dr. Marina? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So encoding involves your brain taking what you just saw, what you just heard, or maybe what you felt or smelled or tasted, and converting it into chemical and electrical signals in the neurons of your brain. These chemical and electrical signals create what's called a memory trace. So going back to the example of learning anatomy, let's say I'm in anatomy class and we get to the part where we open up the chest and we dissect and study the heart. I get to see it and I get to touch it. I even get to smell the formaldehyde (laughs) that it's preserved in. And I turn it around. I look at it. I notice the blood vessels and where they come out, where they go in. And then we even, you know, what we did was we cut it open and we looked inside at the four compartments or the four chambers of the heart. We looked at the valves. We looked at the muscle walls. 
So after this first lesson in heart anatomy, what happens in my brain is that I've created memory traces. Now, does that mean that I can go and I can give a lecture about heart, heart anatomy to other students? No, definitely not. <laughs> it just means that I'm beginning to lay the foundations of new learning about the heart in my brain. Great. So after the first stage, the second stage of learning is called consolidation. What is that? Okay. In the next step, the brain basically takes that memory trace and reorganizes and stabilizes it. Nobody really knows exactly how this happens, but we think that the brain replays the information and tries to make sense of it. It connects it to things we already know or to past experiences. It tries to fill in the blanks and it may even try to attach meaning to the things that we just learned. And importantly, um, sleep is very important in this process. So, you know, lots of people think we sleep eight hours a day. Why do we need to sleep eight hours a day? Well, it's because a lot of stuff is happening in our brain. It's recharging. It's making sense of what happened during the day. It's processing. It's consolidating those memory traces. And that's part of the process of getting what we learned or what we experienced from short-term memory into long-term memory. So back to the example of learning the anatomy of the human heart. I head home after anatomy lab and the memory traces of seeing and feeling and smelling the human heart are still fresh. During the rest of the day and at night while I'm asleep, I'm not aware of it happening, but my brain is busy at work organizing and stabilizing those memory traces of heart anatomy. Finally, the last step of learning is something called retrieval. Can you tell us about that, Dr. Marina? Of course. So have you ever heard the term use it or lose it? In other words, like if you don't use something that you just learned, you're going to eventually forget it. So that's what this next step is all about. So let's say I finished that lesson on heart anatomy and my brain made those memory traces and went through the process of consolidation. If I never went back and reviewed that heart anatomy, do you think I would remember it in a week or a month or a year later? I don't think so. <laughs> so... <laughs> In order to store that heart anatomy into long-term memory, I have to go back and I have to review it. I have to practice what's called retrieving it or recalling it. In other words, I have to practice taking it out from my memory over and over again. Now, if I don't do that, I'm probably not going to do well on my anatomy test. And I'm definitely not going to remember the parts of the heart a year later. So what I actually did when I was learning heart anatomy is I practiced drawing the heart over and over again. And so by forcing myself to draw pictures of the heart, both the outer view and the inside view, I forced my brain to practice retrieving or recalling those memories that had been formed for the first time, the first time I studied the heart. So if I forget something, I would look back at my textbook or at the dissected heart and remind myself fill in the blanks, keep practicing over and over again until I remembered all of those parts of the human heart. And then, you know, when it comes to heart anatomy, it's something that's so important in medicine. You know, every time you go to the doctor, your doctor puts your, the stethoscope on and listens to your heart. Um, so we have to remember all of those things that we learned about heart anatomy on a regular day-to-day -day basis as a doctor. So because Every day or every week, we're doing something that forces us to remember things about the heart. We're constantly having to access that memory. So something like heart anatomy is like drilled into the mind of mm -hmm. almost every doctor because we use it all of the time. Yeah. And I think, too, it'll be in layers like Dr. Marina say. You'll, you'll, you'll have to look look at it over and over and over again, no matter if you're five years from practice, 10 years from practice, mm -hmm. doctors constantly, constantly look up the information all over again to remember more and more and more. So that way your library of knowledge of even say just the heart continues to build. So that way it's there available for you to retrieve it more rapidly each time. Let's dig deeper into this idea of retrieval. You mentioned that retrieval practice or quizzing yourself over and over about something until you master it is really important. How can students do this in their day-to-day -day learning? Yes. Okay. So let's focus on this very important concept of retrieval practice or recall practice, which is an excellent form of active learning. 
If you remember on our episode on study habits, we talked about the importance of active learning. There's an excellent book on this topic called Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning by Peter C. Brown, Henry L. Rediger III, and Mark A. McDaniel. So I love this book. I read it just recently, and it just talks a lot about this concept of learning something and making it stick, right? Like, how do you not just learn something for the first time when you read it, but then it's gone like a week later? How do you actually remember it and force your brain to memorize it for the long term? So we're going to take some key concepts from that book and share them with you here. So they go over a couple of basic ideas. We're going to cover four or five of them, but a couple of concepts about how we really make things stick, like they call it. So the first idea is that we have to practice retrieving or recalling learning from memory. In other words, they call it self-quizzing. Now, when we think of quizzing ourselves, we tend to think of flashcards. Flashcards are great, but they are not the only way to quiz yourself on something. There are other methods. So one method is when you're reading something, like if you're reading a textbook about history or about um, architecture or about physics or about chemistry, whatever it is you're reading, pause to ask yourself without looking back at the text, what are the key ideas that I just read? What words or terms are new to me? What do they mean? Can I define them to myself or to someone else? How do these concepts I'm learning relate to what I already know? And how would I explain this to someone else if I had to? So um, this whole concept of explaining this to someone else, it's great because it's another method of quizzing yourself. So if you ever have like studied in a group or studied with a partner, um, this is a great way of quizzing yourself on something you just learned. So try teaching your friend, maybe like defining some of the concepts or teaching them about um, the glycolysis cycle or whatever it is you just learned. Try teaching it back to them. That's going to force you to recall the information and make sure that you understand it. Because if you've ever tried this, if you've ever tried teaching someone else what you just learned, you realize very quickly the things that you do understand and the things you don't understand. So it's a great way of forcing yourself to identify the weaknesses and then gives you an opportunity to go back, understand it, and try teaching it again. And then they can do that back to you, and it can be really helpful for both of you. Another technique you can use is called concept mapping, or some people call it mind mapping. So I recently was talking to um, a medical student that was on one of our um, interviews a few weeks back. She's in her second year of medical school. And she told me that she found this idea or this practice of concept mapping to be really helpful for her when she was in her medical school classes trying to just like absorb tons and tons of information. She said she had tried flashcards. She had tried a couple of other things and they just didn't work super well for her. But this idea of mind mapping or concept mapping did. So the example she gave me is, let's say she is studying high blood pressure in her pathophysiology class. So she'll get out a diagram, a piece of paper in the middle, right, high blood pressure. And then she kind of expands it out, kind of like, you know, a tree branch. You have your concept in the middle, and then you make branches from there into like subtopics about that topic. So she would expand it out with things like, okay, what are the causes of high blood pressure? The causes include genetic causes, hormonal causes, kidney causes, uh, vascular causes, pregnancy, et cetera. And then she would make another branch or keep expanding it out. So what are the signs and symptoms of high blood pressure? What are the diagnostic tests? What are the treatment? And then expand it more with things like, what are the abnormal values? What are the normal values? How do these medications for high blood pressure work? What are the side effects of the blood pressure medications? So she would end up with this really big diagram with high blood pressure in the middle and like all of these branches with information coming out from there. And then in order to quiz herself, she would try to sort of write out the diagram over and over again, either on paper or just in her mind, and then refer back to her her original to see if she was getting it right. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. So then another thing, 
like I mentioned in anatomy, I would just draw out the heart. I did this with a lot of other things, like with in biochemistry, you have to learn a lot of pathways, like the glycolysis pathway, which converts glucose into energy. So the way I memorized that was just by writing it out over and over again. Dr. Zuma, what were some of your favorite methods of recall practice or self-quizzing when you were in school? I think you touched on a lot of them. Um, if if I were to recommend would be probably doing the the group studying. I find that it was more the most effective in medical school. I wish I knew about it in undergrad because I didn't do it. I was more individual studying where I just go by mm -hmm. myself to the library. And I don't think that helped with improving my memory. Uh, so I did a lot. If I was by myself, I found that doing the uh, concept mapping was the best to do when I was alone. So I would do charts and charts and charts and diagrams and diagrams because I'm a visual person. Um, flashcards did not work for me, just like you mentioned with that medical student. I just didn't feel like that really helped with uh, mm -hmm. me being able to retrieve anything. So lots of charts, um, lots of um, pictures mm -hmm. that I would personally draw. So then that way, if I'm actively drawing them, I'm going to be able to recall them. Then the biggest reinforcer I feel mm -hmm. is what you mentioned, which was the teaching back uh, with a friend or in a group. So I usually studied with about um, three to four people, and we were basically the same three to four people in medical school. And uh, we did a lot of self-quizzing to each other. So uh, we would be studying, and then I'd say, hey, so-and-so, so what's this and this? And then they'd say it back. Or if we were going through... Um, mm -hmm. like the glycolysis cycle. Okay, we would take turns actually doing it on a board and then explaining it to each other. And then if I would get stuck, oh, guys, I don't get this part. And then I would have them explain it to me if if uh, if they understood. And usually one of you will understand uh, a certain part that another one doesn't. So you're able to self-teach, but do it in a way that you guys can understand with each other. Um and those things, as I'm taking from what I recall, as I'm taking exams, I would remember those conversations with my group, or I would remember the mm -hmm. diagram or the chart of where that information, and that's where I would store it so I could retrieve. And, and I felt like that's where my memory most improved. Yeah. I use charts a lot too, you know, like, because sometimes you just have all this information in just like a textbook format and putting mm -hmm. it into a table or a chart can be really helpful um, to organize the information in your brain. Cause I'm also a very visual learner. Mm -hmm. So putting it into a nice neat chart where there were categories was really helpful for me. Um, and I remember on tests also being able to be like, Oh, you know, I remember where on that chart that was and exactly. I can access that information. <laughs> so exactly. Yeah. Not everyone is a visual learner. So mm -hmm. do what works best for you. But these are a couple of ideas on really just learning how to quiz yourself, whether you're an audio, you know, more of an auditory learner, visual learner, whatever it is, find a way to quiz yourself about the stuff you're learning that works for you. Mm -hmm. So another concept covered in the book, Make It Stick, is about spacing out your self-quizzing. So basically after you study something or learn something for the first time, it's normal to forget some of it after a while. And if you quiz yourself on it again the next day, you're actually going to probably remember most of it or a good amount of it. But if you wait a week or a few weeks, you'll probably forget most of it by that time. So you kind of want to find the sweet spot of time between quizzing yourself so that it's not too easy, but it's not too hard to remember. So maybe, you know, after learning heart anatomy, I go back the next day, it's still fresh. I kind of review the material, try to quiz myself on the major concepts. And then instead of just doing it every single day, because you probably won't have time anyway to do it every single day, maybe wait a couple of days and then quiz yourself again on it to make sure you're remembering. The more times that you force yourself to recall something, of course, the better you're going to remember it. But if you make it too easy by doing it like every few hours or every day, you're not challenging your brain enough. So there is kind of this sweet spot of you don't want it to be too easy, but you don't want it to be too, too hard in terms of the spacing out between your quizzing sessions. Um, 
So typically, if you're learning something new for the first time, like anatomy, physiology, microbiology, physics, chemistry, um, a few days between reviewing material is usually about the right amount of time. But again, it varies based on your subject and your own ability to memorize things. Mm -hmm. For things that you've mastered before, once every few months or even every year or two can be enough. So Mm -hmm. for example, doctors have to refresh their CPR training every year or every two years. Now that's because, you know, we did a lot of CPR at some point in our training. We really got it down. We mastered it. And so we just need to like every year or two get a refresher course so that we make sure we remember it whenever we need to use it for some reason. So um, another concept covered in the book is about mixing up what you study. It's really helpful if you divide your study time between different subjects is what a lot of different studies have shown. So, for example, if you're taking physics, organic chemistry and political science, you want to mix it up. So don't spend two whole days doing physics and then two whole days doing OCHEM and two whole days doing political science, because it's actually going to be better if every day you're doing two hours of physics, two hours of OCHEM, two hours of political science and learning that way. Um, That's just what studies have shown. Um, And then even within a subject. So let's say you have your OCHEM textbook and one chapter is on one thing, another chapter is on another thing, third chapter is on a third thing. You know, sometimes it actually helps when you're reviewing the material to skip between chapters. Don't just do all of the questions in one chapter first, all the questions in another chapter second. If you actually mix them up when you're going back to review them, it's more helpful than if you do all of one thing, all of another thing, all of another thing. So mixing it up in terms of spacing things out and also mixing up what you study can be really helpful. Um, There was a study that showed that they looked at people who were practicing baseball, like professional baseball players, and they were looking at how they practice their hits. Um, So in one situation, um, the baseball players, they got 15 fastballs and they got to practice hitting. And then they got 15 curveballs that they practiced hitting. And then they got 15 what's called change-ups that they practiced hitting. So yeah, that's good practice because they're practicing how to hit the different types of balls. But then in another situation, these baseball players were given the same type three types of balls to hit, but they were mixed up. So they, you know, one was a fastball, one was a curveball, another fastball, a changeup. And so it was mixed up. And so they actually learned even better how to hit because they were changing it up instead of just doing all one type of ball, all another type of ball. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Another thing that the authors of this book talk about is the idea that the more difficult something is to recall, the better you will learn it. So this is kind of a hard one because we don't like to make things harder for ourselves. (laughs) But in this case, research shows that it is worth it. For example, if you're using flashcards, don't just do the flashcards in the same order. Mix it up. Make it harder, right? I, I remember, you know, sometimes in college or in medical school, sometimes it was those hardest problems in a problem set or in a homework assignment or in a test, those are the ones that I remember best because I struggled (laughs) to get the answer and I struggled to get it right. Um, What about you, Dr. Zuma? Do you remember anything in the process of learning or studying where it was really hard, but you remembered it better because it was hard? Yeah, so um, I remember, and I think this, why it was so hard was because of a it was neurology, but it, I think it was hard because um, the one of the professors um, that taught it was not necessarily very nice to me. <laughs> so it, it was almost like yeah. this pressure of needing to understand the material, but because of this pressure that I knew somebody was looking down on me made it harder for me to actually retain it while I was in medical school. But I tried really hard and studied a lot. And today, now I understand a lot about neurology really well because of it. So, and it was because I struggled to learn it. 
So mm-hmm. I would say neurology, if I can recall that. Another one would uh, would be the medications. When we did pharmacology, I felt so overwhelmed with how many medications we had to memorize and the side effects, what they were for, contraindications that there were specific groups of medications that I ended up until today, even though I don't use them in children because they're more so for adults, I just, they're ingrained in my mind. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's true for me too. Yeah. But looking back, definitely there were some things that I just, I struggled with more for whatever reason. Um, but, you know, it's something about that process of struggling and wrestling with something mm-hmm. It's actually make going to make it stick even better mm-hmm. <laughs> because of that struggle that goes along with yeah. it. So something magical about the way the brain works. But it is true that the more difficult something is to recall, the better you will learn it. So sometimes making your study habits a little more challenging is going to help your memory in the long term. All right. Another topic the book talks about is using mnemonics. So mnemonics, M-N-E-M-O-N-I-C-S. It's kind of a funny word. The word mnemonic comes from the Greek word for memory. And mnemonics are basically mental tools that can help us remember information. It's especially useful for long lists of information or things that are not logical or intuitive in any way. So when I was, I, I took like a year of piano lessons when I was young. And so I had to learn how to read the notes, you know, in music, like on musical sheets. And um, there's the treble clef at the top and the, just these little black lines with white spaces in between. And then there are four white spaces. And you learn when you're first learning piano or any musical instrument that those white spaces stand for the notes A, C, E, and G, or that's where the notes would be. And the way we remembered that was all cows eat grass, or if you wanted to be funny, all cows eject gas. So (laughs) that was just like the little mnemonic, A, C, E, and G for those notes. Um, And there are others, of course, that help you learn all of the different (laughs) notes as well. Um, Another one I remember, which is kind of funny from anatomy, (laughs) was you have a bunch of bones in your wrist. And... They have really weird names that are kind of hard to remember, so it's not intuitive in any way. (laughs) So the mnemonic that we would use is some lovers try positions that they can't handle. (laughs) So very memorable, a little bit racy, (laughs) but that stands for scaphoid, lunate, triquetrium, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. So as you can hear, those are not like easy to remember names, but having a funny mnemonic, like some lovers try positions that they can't handle, can (laughs) really help you to remember something that is very hard to remember. Dr. Zuma, do you remember any mnemonics that helped you (laughs) during (laughs) undergrad or during medical school? Well, what's interesting with me, it, I had to create my own mnemonics because if somebody told me a mnemonic, I would screw up the mnemonic. <laughs> it's almost like I could never be a singer because I would screw up the words of a song. I, I'm, the, I'm, I'm that person that hears a song. And then when I repeat the song, I'm completely saying it wrong. Okay, so um, what I <laughs> gotcha. do instead is I would create my own mnemonics and then I would memorize them because I made them myself. And that's how I would recall it. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, they were, but I did use them though occasionally, but I did use them. Uh-huh, yeah. I remember we were trying, we were trying to memorize me and a friend We were studying like chemotherapy drugs. And these were chemotherapy Mm -hmm. drugs that I'd never heard of before. And they were really Mm -hmm. hard. And each of them has this like um, its own set of really random side effects, right? And so we were like cramming the day before a test. And we're like, how the heck are we going to remember these chemotherapy drugs and all of these random side effects, right? (laughs) And so my friend and I, like we drew these ridiculous figures, like these little just kind of silly stick figures and each of them had like silly things on them like if it if the drug caused caused bone marrow suppression then we would like make the leg on the stick figure like look like a little bone and make it really silly or just you know if 
-hmm. It caused hair loss. We would make the stick figure without hair, something like that. So we ended up with like this set of really silly stick figures, (laughs) but it really helped us. Like the next day when we were taking that test, I was like, oh, I remember that stick figure. (laughs) And it was just... It was just a really silly way of kind of cramming that information. Now, I don't think that really stayed (laughs) in my long-term memory because I didn't use it again for many, many years. But when I did use it again a few years later, I kind of remembered some Mm -hmm. of those silly stick figures. So um, anyway, so mnemonics can be really helpful. You can make them as silly or funny or serious as you want, but they can be just an extra tool um, in your toolkit for learning. All right, moving on. So another point that we want to make um, is that in order to keep your brain and your memory working at its best, you really have to keep your mind, which is part of your whole body, healthy. So I like to think of it in terms of like a car analogy. Let's suppose someone gave you a new car. Like that happens, but let's just pretend. Um, Dr. Zulma, what would you do to take care of your brand new car? Okay, so I would make sure the tank is full with the right kind of gas. Uh, Regular fluid checks, fluid changes, like the antifreeze and the oil. Get it washed occasionally to keep the paint nice. Make sure the tires have enough air pressure. I think that's usually what I do Mm -hmm. with the car. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. You know, your standard maintenance, right? But yeah. you got you got to do it. So, what do you expect might happen if you don't do those things to maintain it? Well, the the car will start having problems. They make they could start making funny noises, or usually the long term effect is that they just break down earlier. Or you uh-huh. have your AC stop working, your windows, your engine, transmission, whatever it might be. Exactly. So, you know, your whole body is kind of like a car, right? (laughs) Except when it comes to your body, I like to remind people you only get one. (laughs) If you ruin your body (laughs) without there's no replacement, you don't. (laughs) Exactly. You don't get another one. (laughs) No matter how much money you have, you you can't buy a new body. Mm -hmm. So you need to take care of it if you want it to work well for you. And you know, I think a lot of people have this misconception that like your brain is like its own thing that's separate from the rest of your body. Mm -hmm. But really the truth is that your brain is a very connected part of your body. It's connected to the rest of your body in very intricate ways. And how you take care of your heart and your muscles and your intestinal tract actually affects the the way that your brain works. So you can't look at them separately. You really have to treat your brain and the rest of your physical body as a whole. So how do you take care of your body as a whole in a way that will keep your brain and your memory in optimal shape? The first one I want to talk about is you have to get enough sleep. Now, you might not be able to get enough sleep 100% of the time, but try your best to get enough sleep most of the time. And why is this? So when we sleep, a few important things happen. When we're sleeping, it's sort of like the housekeepers of the brain are coming in. (laughs) It's kind of like if you think of like a hospital or clinic, when do the housekeepers come in? They come in after everybody's done working. They come in at night, right? So that's when the cleanup processes of the brain happening. And one of those processes is what we talked about, this memory consolidation. So taking those memory traces from what you learned that day, organizing and stabilizing them in order to get on that path towards long-term memory. So if you're sleep deprived, if you're not getting enough sleep, the amount of sleep you need at night to feel well rested, a couple of things happen. So first of all, your brain neurons, the cells of your brain cannot fire as well because that cleanup was not done properly overnight. Also, you can't focus well. I know I've done this many Mm -hmm. times. Sometimes you just can't get enough sleep. Have you ever tried being like in a slightly dark lecture hall, looking at a PowerPoint, and (laughs) instead of paying attention, what's happening? (laughs) And just (laughs) nodding off, nodding off. Uh, That has happened to me. You know, sometimes you just can't get enough sleep no matter how you try. You're exhausted. You can't focus. Like, I'm nodding off instead of paying attention. I'm sure that's familiar to you, Dr. Zulma, right? Oh, yeah. I remember I I, I was in residency, and it was a post-call day. Post-call just means that you've worked over 24 hours straight, and we were rounding in the morning, and um, 
we, you know, I was my turn to present a patient overnight. And all of a sudden I look at everybody's face and then my attending, which is the, the doctor teacher, and they look so confused. And I thought, why are they look? Did I uh-huh. say something wrong? I was speaking Spanish instead of English. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you don't oh focus. Gosh, and I had no hilarious. idea. I was, and you know, my friend started laughing, my co-resident, and I said, what did I say? And she's like, you've been talking Spanish the entire time. I was like, really? I mean, that's, that's how, and that's sleep deprived. I had not slept in like, like what, 25, 26 Uh, hours straight at that point. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So sleep deprivation does very strange things to your brain. So you need it, right? Like, and of course, like when you're a resident, you have to do those overnight shifts. Like you're not always going to get that sleep, but then hopefully you go home and you catch up on that sleep that you need. So, Oh yeah. um, And then regarding sleep. So most of us, because we can't always get as much sleep as we need, we use coffee and we use caffeinated drinks to help increase our alertness and our focus. But be careful with caffeine, please. Too much can affect your sleep and therefore it can affect the process of memory consolidation. Generally speaking, I think avoiding caffeine afternoon is a good idea because what happens is caffeine has a pretty long what they call half-life, meaning that the molecules of caffeine, once they're in your bloodstream, they actually stick around for a really long time. It's not like they're just gone a few hours later. So if you drink caffeine afternoon, the caffeine is still in your system at pretty high levels when you're trying to sleep at night and it's going to interfere with your sleep. So I actually don't drink coffee except for on rare occasions when I really need it. How about you, Dr. Zulma? Do you drink coffee regularly? And if so, how do you make sure not to overdo it? I do. I drink coffee, um, just one cup every morning and I avoid drinking in the afternoon because I did realize that I was not able to sleep at night. Either it's hard for me to fall asleep or it's not good restful sleep where the following day I feel like I can't focus as much or it just, your body just doesn't feel right. Unfortunately, in college, Mm -hmm. I was terrible at this. I used to, especially during testing time, I would drink so much coffee. But when I think back, I wonder Uh if if that actually negatively influenced my performance on some of those exams that I struggled with, especially that first year in college where I didn't do very well. So if if you guys do Uh drink coffee, I would say in the morning, okay, go ahead, wake up your brain, but avoid it uh, in the afternoon. I think a better way to get your body uh, waking up in the afternoon is to exercise. Uh huh. I agree with that. Yeah. And when we're talking about coffee here, it's not just coffee. It's also all those caffeinated drinks, Um, even things like Pepsi and Coke have caffeine, Mm -hmm. although lower levels, but definitely those things like, you know, monster drinks and and all of that stuff, (laughs) high, high levels of caffeine. Yeah, those have very high yeah. levels of caffeine. And not only will they interfere with their sl- your sleep, but they can also give you heart palpitations and other health problems. So be really careful just when you use caffeine, generally speaking. Yeah, and I think if you do <coughs> uh, drink those, given it can give you an increased heart rate, it almost builds a sense of anxiety inside. So it's even harder for you to study. So it, it's almost like where you could have tried to retrieve and maintain information over one or two hours because you drank this and you're just more anxious and might take you longer to actually learn the same amount of information. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. All right. A common question that people have is how much sleep do we actually need? So this is highly variable. It really depends on your own physiology, your genetics, your personal, you know, um, habits and needs. Most young people, so, you know, high school through your 20, through your mid 20s, maybe you need about seven to nine hours per night of good quality sleep. Now, you know, that is hard to get. Most people are not getting that many hours of sleep at night. Now, sometimes naps can help. So let's say you need eight hours of sleep but you only got seven last night. Well, if you add an hour nap in, you know, after school or between classes or after work, and that can help to make up that deficit from the night before. Um, now, a very lucky few people are what are called short sleepers. So that means that they 
for some reason, don't need as much sleep as the rest of us. They can get away with five or six hours a night. This is pretty uncommon. <laughs> and I know some people think that they are short sleepers, but it's actually because they drink way too much caffeine <laughs> that they think they're short sleepers. But some people truly are. For some reason, their brain is more efficient somehow. I don't really know how this works, honestly, but we do know that there are a few people in this world who just don't need as much sleep on a daily basis. But like I said, I find that most young people, I know patients I've seen, people, people I interact with, that you're not getting those seven to nine hours per night of good quality sleep. What do you think, Dr. Zuma? Yeah, I, I agree. I think the sleep hygiene is an issue for a lot of people. And I think this is for teenagers and also for adults as well. Um, I had a, I had very terrible sleep hygiene in college. I think I did uh-huh. sleep the eight hours, but it was at the wrong eight hours. So for example, go to bed at two and then wake up like at nine or 10 and then skip out on my class yeah. in the morning, uh, which was not good. So I had to readjust what a good eight hours because it's not only just consecutive sleep, but also that you're going to sleep at the same time every day. Um, I feel on average, um, most people do well eight to nine hours. I find for myself, it's nine. And when I sleep nine hours, I feel like a brand new person the following day. In regards to naps, I I feel you have to be careful with that one. Because if you do nap, it can disrupt your night's sleep. You're already rested. So when it comes say eight, nine or 10, whenever your bedtime is, and you have a, some people can have a hard time falling asleep because that daytime nap actually disrupted your sleep. So I, I can't, I can take naps if I, if I were to lie down, I, I easily, luckily I easily fall asleep, but I avoid doing daytime naps because it disrupts my nighttime sleep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point because some people can do it safely and some can't. Um, My husband sometimes has trouble sleeping at night and I try to discourage him from taking naps because Mm -hmm. he'll complain. He's like, I'm just so tired, you know, but I'm like, well, if you force yourself to just make it through today really tired, then tonight when you go to bed, you're going to fall asleep right away instead of take a nap. Then when bedtime comes around, you're not as tired, you have trouble sleeping again, Mm -hmm. and then it just, the cycle just repeats. So sometimes if you are overall a good sleeper and you don't have trouble falling asleep at night or staying asleep, then naps are probably pretty safe if you need them. But if you're the type of person that has trouble sleeping at night, be very careful with naps. Mm -hmm. One thing I see in teenagers is that, you know, they're really tired, they come home from school, they take a nap, and then, you know, they're not tired again until two in the morning. Yeah. So that that cycle of sleeping from like two to nine or two to 10, like persists. And mm-hmm. during the summertime when you're on vacation, okay, maybe you can sustain that. But during the school year, if you're going to sleep at two in the morning and you have to get up at six, that is not a good system to have. <laughs> so not be careful. <laughs> yeah, be careful how you use naps. Um, I should also mention that there's a natural phenomenon that happens when you become a teenager, your circadian rhythm changes so that you don't get tired until later Mm -hmm. and you don't want to wake up until later. (laughs) And so parents will often come to us pediatricians complaining that my teenager doesn't sleep. Like they don't go to sleep until midnight and then they have to go get up at six for morning six in the morning for school, and then they're really tired all the time. Well, part of it is this natural circadian rhythm that happens in all teenagers that your body just doesn't want to fall asleep. It doesn't feel sleepy until later. Mm -hmm. Um, So some school systems have like changed school hours to make it so that school starts later for high school Mm -hmm. students. But unfortunately, most schools are still starting pretty early. So it can be difficult. And it's not just during your teenage years that this happens. This persists into your early 20s. So in college, you know, that tendency that you mentioned to sleep at 2 (laughs) a.m. until 9 a.m., like that's a pretty common thing. Um, But obviously you have to figure out what's going to work so that you can get to those classes Mm -hmm. and succeed in your schoolwork as well. Yeah, I agree. So um, a lot of this... Um, knowledge about sleep and the importance of sleep is covered in an excellent book called Why We Sleep 
Unlocking the Power of Sleep and Dreams by Matthew Walker. It's a pretty dense read because it really goes into kind of the chemistry and physiology and lots of research about this topic. But if you're interested in understanding more about why we sleep, what happens while we sleep, what are the long-term effects of sleep deprivation, this is a good book to check out called Why We Sleep. So overall, regarding sleep, we have to make sleep a priority. If you never get enough sleep, you need to reprioritize your life. You need to look at all the things you're doing during the day that eat up your time and try to eliminate some of the things that maybe aren't as important. Um, you know, if unfortunately, like we've talked about economic realities, if you're in college and you have to work two jobs to support yourself and you're trying to take a full course load, Maybe maybe you can't cut back on working because you need that money, but maybe you can cut back on those classes and just realize that it's going to take you longer to finish your coursework. But you have to make sleep a priority and reprioritize things in your life in order to get that sleep that you need. Um, of course, if you have a medical or a mental health condition that interferes with quality sleep, please see your doctor to address it so that you can start getting the sleep that you need. There are unfortunately a lot of medications, medical conditions, um, things like depression and anxiety can definitely affect your sleep. So please get the help that you need if you suffer from any of those. Um, do you have any other tips, Dr. Zulma, for getting enough sleep? Yeah, I, I think it's really important, and this one's going to be hard for many, <laughs> keep yeah. electronics out of your bedroom. I mean, just keep them out. Do not. Ha I grew up in a household where each bedroom had a TV. So I grew up falling asleep to the TV. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think that helped. Um, but like just not having a TV in your room, turn off your laptops. And then even when it's bedtime, turning off your phone, like off. Because if you hear a message that comes in, your your temptation to look at it is there. So just removing that temptation uh -huh. and go back to the old school alarm clocks. Just get an alarm clock and start waking up to that so you're not relying on your phone because a lot of people use their phone for their alarm. But electronics have really, really, and this isn't just for, you know, you guys in high school, adults as well. It's just really contributed to poor sleep. So if there's anything, if you have a TV in your room, just take it out. <laughs> I actually now do not have a television yeah. ever since. I think ever since I got married, we decided on that and we've raised so far kids and that's foreign to them. So, and it really does help as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, I totally agree with that. The blue light that's emitted from a lot of electronics, mm -hmm. like computer screens and mm -hmm. cell phones, it's actually been shown to interfere like it, um, it's perceived by your, your, through your eyes and it signals a certain part of your brain that controls the circadian rhythm of mm -hmm. your body. And so it will actually, even if your body would naturally be sleepy and ready to fall asleep at a certain time, if it's being exposed to that blue light, that signal in your brain that tells you it's time to sleep is not going to work properly. So mm -hmm. I echo what you said, be very careful with those electronics. Um, there's a feature on most phones now that you can like put, you know, schedule your phone to not interrupt you between mm -hmm. whatever hours you want. So I have mine set to not interrupt me between 11 and seven in the morning. That way I know that I'm not going to accidentally wake up to like sounds or calls mm -hmm. or text messages or Facebook alerts or any of that stuff. Because before I had that setting, sometimes those things were waking me up and it was really annoying. All right. Next tip on taking care of your brain, which is part of the rest of your body, is regular exercise and specifically cardiovascular exercise. So, you know, I think a lot of us, when we think of exercise, we think that, oh, you know, I should exercise in order to get a six pack or to lose weight <laughs> or to be really good at sports. Um, but if I don't care about any of those things, I don't have to exercise. <laughs> so unfortunately, that is a pretty common misconception that exercise is just for people who care about their appearance or their sports performance or their weight. But really, cardiovascular exercise is important for everybody, no matter what your weight or your size exercise can be so beneficial. And 
the way your cardiovascular system works, cardiovascular system is your heart and all of your blood vessels in your body. You have your heart, which is connected to these blood vessels that run throughout your whole body. When your heart pumps, it's delivering blood, which contains oxygen and energy and nutrients to all of your muscles. Your head, including your brain, your eyes, your mouth, your organs, your lungs, intestines, kidneys, etc., and everything else that needs those things. So those blood vessels that carry blood and oxygen and nutrients throughout your body are very important. If they are not healthy, then your muscles and your organs, including your brain, can't be as healthy as they should be because they can't get those things that they need, including oxygen and energy and nutrients. Now, the walls of your blood vessels are kind of soft and rubbery. They have different um, layers. One of them is a muscle layer. One of them is something called an endothelial lining. Um, and those layers all together, they work to make this kind of soft and rubbery thing that can contract and it can expand depending on the needs of your body at any given moment. So when we do cardiovascular exercise, and cardiovascular exercise is anything that gets your heart pumping and forces you to start breathing faster. Um, so these are things like soccer, dancing, aerobics, running. Think of anything that just makes you work really hard. Your body releases chemicals during that process that help keep those blood vessels young and healthy and pliable and rubbery and soft. So people who don't exercise regularly, they can actually develop stiff blood vessels that don't deliver blood very well to various parts of their body, including your brain, your heart, your muscles, everything else. This can increase your risk of cardiovascular diseases like heart attacks and strokes. Studies have also shown that not getting enough exercise can lead to higher rates of memory problems like dementia and Alzheimer's. And this is at least partly because those blood vessels that supply oxygen and energy and nutrients to your brain, they don't work as well as they should. What's your favorite way to exercise, Dr. Zulma? So my favorite ways to exercise is running and dancing. I danced for many years and then uh -huh. running. I like doing 5Ks and, and things nice. like that. But given COVID recently, I obviously haven't been able to engage as much as that. So currently, my favorite exercise that I do every week is um, a stationary bike. I do the Peloton bike. And... Um, it's uh -huh. neat because I get to connect with my best friend who lives in Washington, D.C., and we're able to uh, plan out our workouts together, uh -huh. and we get to see each other work out while we're exercising nice. and, and listening to the music I like on it. I love hip hop, so we're always so we're always listening to that music together, and there's an instructor. So, But it, it's like Dr. Marina said, I mean, I don't do it, oh, because I want to lose weight or it's none of those reasons. It's really just for the health that's involved in it because I know I'm taking care of every organ in my body while I'm doing it. What about you, Dr. Marina? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I do like running. Well, okay. I don't necessarily like running, <laughs> but I do it. I force myself to do it because... I feel good after I run and I feel like it really, really helps to keep me just fit overall. Like I can just, you know, my heart rate, my resting heart rate is pretty low because I run. Um, but I also like to mix up running with other things. If I run mm -hmm. every day, my muscles get tight. I just don't like it. So I do yoga sometimes. Mm -hmm. I do dance videos sometimes. I do something called high intensity, high intensity interval training sometimes called HIT. And that's just mm -hmm. basically like short bursts of really intense things like burpees or, you know, weighted squats or all sorts of torture. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, it's like a pretty short workout. It's like maybe 30 minutes. So it's something that I can easily fit into my day. I don't like to like go to the gym, spend 20 minutes yeah, getting to the gym, mm -hmm. an hour at the gym, 20 minutes getting back. I like to do stuff that I can just do at home. So I have a yoga mat. I have a couple of weights. I have a subscription to something called Daily Burn, which gives you access to a whole library of workout videos. So I never get bored because I have that video of workout uh, videos that it's like, oh, let me turn it on. Let's see what I'm in the mood for today. So I do run twice a week, sometimes three times a week if I'm training for something like a half marathon or a race. But usually it's running twice a week and then 
you know, three days a week of other stuff, whatever I'm in the mood for. So the bottom line is exercise to take care of your body, including your heart, your blood vessels, and your brain. You don't have to run marathons or win dance competitions. Just move your body and get that heart pumping at least three days a week for 30 to 60 minutes. And just do whatever you can. You know, try to fit it in. If you have to start making a habit of it and just start once a week, then do that. And then slowly as you can, increase it to two times a week or three times a week, whatever you can do. Even if you don't end up with those six-pack abs, your body <laughs> and your brain and your memory will thank you. Lastly, we want to talk just briefly about good nutrition. So back to that car analogy, you have to give the car the right fuel. So what is the right fuel? Um, we don't have time to go into much detail, but generally speaking, whole grains so whole grains are things like whole wheat bread or whole wheat berries, uh, brown rice instead of white rice, um, quinoa, buckwheat. There are a whole bunch of whole grains, but the ones we usually eat are like rice and wheat. So trying to make those whole grains instead of the refined grains like the white rice and the regular white wheat flour that we use can get your body more fiber and more of those nutrients that it needs. Um, also, of course, we all know we should eat our fruits and vegetables, and the more colorful, the better. The reason that the more color is better is because color in a fruit or vegetable means that it has more phytonutrients, and these are basically like chemicals that come from plants that have beneficial effects on your health. For example, antioxidants that come from blueberries have anti-aging effects and positive effects on your blood vessels. There are also healthy proteins, uh, white meats. Red meats are not so great really when it comes mm -hmm. to health because of the high, high levels of saturated fat, mm -hmm. um, but also beans and tofu are included in those healthy proteins. I do wanna mention dairy briefly. Dairy can be part of a healthy diet, but it's actually not necessary for good health. There are large parts of the world, including most of you know Asia that do not consume dairy products because of high levels of lactose intolerance, and they can still be very, very healthy. So um, as long as you're getting calcium from other sources, including soy, beans, lentils, peas, dark leafy greens, some nuts and seeds, you're gonna be fine. <laughs> and uh, studies have actually shown interestingly that more than two servings a day of dairy might actually have negative effects on your health. So dairy can be part of a healthy diet, just don't overdo it. And then of course, get used to drinking water. Water should be the main thing that you're drinking each day. Um, ideally, really the only thing you're drinking. We live in an age of, you know, sugary coffee drinks, of soft drinks, soda, all sorts of other yummy beverages that are there to tempt us. But really what our body needs most is water. Um, we want to limit sugar, including all of those like soft drinks, even Gatorade and Powerade can mm -hmm. have a lot of sugar. Um, artificial sweeteners are an option, of course, like your Diet Coke, but you try, it's really better to use them in moderation because we don't understand fully the effects of those artificial sweeteners on our health. And then of course, limit processed foods. So processed foods are like all the stuff that has all these ingredients in it that you can't even read or understand <laughs> or like or pronounce. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, you know, Doritos and chips are like a highly processed food because where did they come from? Well, I guess mostly from corn, but do Doritos look anything like corn? No, they don't <laughs> because they went through a, a, a lot of processing in order to come up with that mm -hmm. Dorito, <laughs> right? So um, anything, you know, anything else that's gone through a lot of processing in order to create the food that's in front of you. Like if you can't understand everything in that ingredient list, it's probably a processed food <laughs> to be yeah. honest. So. And then of course, if you have food sensitivities, gluten intolerance, lactose intolerance, anything else, respect them, listen to your body and feed it what makes it feel best. You do not have to be a nutrition Nazi. <laughs> Just do what you can to keep improving little by little as you are able to. Anything to add to that, Dr. Zuma? 
Yeah, that I mean, I just I, I usually just tell people and I apply it to myself is just keep temptation out of your kitchen. That's like the best mm -hmm. way because if there are chips there in your cabinet and you're uh -huh. having a not so great day, you're just gonna go for the chips, the ice cream or whatever yeah. you have. So I usually say, you know, when you go to the grocery store, you have what you're going to buy, but just don't have temptation at home. So that way you're not even tempted to eat it um, and keep your fruit bowl full. Uh-huh. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Because when you are craving something sweet, you know, we, we do. I have a big sweet tooth, so I <laughs> crave stuff. So I try to keep stuff in my fruit bowl that I can eat. Um, I try to keep some like dark chocolate covered nuts as like yeah. a treat also because at least it's a little bit healthier yeah. um not if you like eat a whole pound of them but yeah, yeah. I like, <laughs> yeah. but I love chocolate so I try to have some dark chocolate for those days when I really need it yeah I just feel that you know eating is so tied to your emotional state as well for many mm -hmm. or for all of us um, so if we have the bad foods around, we're just going to be tempted to eat it. And that's for anyone. So our rule of thumb in our house is if it's just not there, we're just not going to eat it. So we go to plan B, which mm -hmm. is usually the fruit bowl. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's great. That's a great habit to develop for children from the time that they're mm -hmm. young is like eating, you know, turning to fruit or vegetables as snacks instead of chips and candy. <laughs> Which, well, even for of adults, course they're delicious. yeah, yeah. I think even mm -hmm. for adults, I did not grow up with going to the fruit bowl. We had a mm -hmm. lot of uh, junk food <laughs> growing up. A lot yeah. of uh, the flour tortillas, the tacos. I mean, everything was fried, right? With chorizo. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All that deliciousness, <laughs> yeah. but I do not buy the deliciousness because if the deliciousness is in my home, I will eat the deliciousness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true no and it's good it's good to know what you, what the temptations are for you and i absolutely agree if it's not in your cabinet you're much less likely to eat it you have to go to the store if you really want it and most of exactly. us aren't going to do that so <laughs> all right so that about wraps it up for our episode today on improving your memory so just to really quick review of the basics learning has three stages encoding consolidation and retrieval or recall. Sleep is really important for that middle step of consolidation, so please don't skimp on sleep. Practice recalling the information you need to learn over and over again. This is where the storage into long-term memory and the ability to access something when you need it comes from. Repetition, repetition, repetition in the form of self-quizzing. Don't just use flashcards. Ask yourself questions as you read, practice teaching things back to each other, draw out figures or concept maps, find what works for you. Also space out your practice, alternate different types of problems or subjects, and make use of those mnemonic devices if you need them. Don't get discouraged if it's hard. Remember the harder it is to recall something, the stronger the learning will be in your brain. And then of course, nutrition and exercise help keep your blood vessels healthy, which help keep your brain functioning at its best. We certainly didn't cover everything there is to know about learning and memory today. There are entire books written on the subject and we can't cover it all, but we hope you found this useful for the type of learning that you'll be doing a lot of as a pre-med, med student and a future doctor. So if you're enjoying this podcast, please remember to subscribe to our podcast. We are available through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. You can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, or TikTok to stay informed about new episodes and other fun stuff. We would love to hear from you, what you like about the show, what you don't, and what you would like to hear more about in future episodes. You can contact us through our website at www.futureminoritydoctor.com by clicking on the Contact Us tab. Also, if you like our show and would like to support the work we're doing, please consider making a donation of any amount, even $1 helps. These donations help pay for our website, recording services, and podcast editing. Please note that you must be 18 years or older to donate. Now, if you're not in a position to donate, because I know this has been a rough year for many people, don't worry and please keep listening and spreading the word. 
A huge shout out to my brother, Sam Capella, who edits our podcast every week. Thank you, Sam. And until next time, future doctors. Peace and love, everyone.